Zacchaeus was not a well-liked person. As chief tax collector, he walked through the streets of Jericho collecting money from people, but had no qualms about keeping some back for himself. People tended to avoid this greedy man, knowing he would only leave them poor. Whenever he passed by, they would whisper his name and call him a thief. In the eyes of many, that's exactly what he was, a thief. One day, a man named Jesus passed through Jericho, and a curious crowd began to form around him. Zacchaeus wanted to know who Jesus was too, and headed toward the crowd. But because he was short, he couldn't see past the others who were gathering and decided to run ahead to find a better place to see. Zacchaeus found a tree and climbed up into the branches, making sure he was high enough to see Jesus, who was walking his way. The crowd followed Jesus' every step. Zacchaeus saw everything from his position. Then he saw Jesus stand still. Surprised, the tax collector's eyes met the friendly face of a stranger. Zacchaeus expected a cold response, a look of condemnation and rejection, but instead he found only warmth in the eyes of Jesus. Zacchaeus was even more surprised when the man spoke to him. Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. His surprise turned to joy, and Zacchaeus came down at once. Joy flooded his heart. He no longer felt rejection or even heard the harsh words coming from the crowd. His eyes were fixed on Jesus. What he saw and heard entered right into his heart and took root deep within his soul. Zacchaeus' greed turned to generosity, and he promised Jesus he would give half of his possessions to the poor. On top of that, he said that if he had cheated anyone, he would pay back four times the amount. His kindness made Jesus happy. His heart had been transformed. And Jesus had done exactly what he came to earth to do, to seek and to save the spiritually lost. So we're all familiar with the story. And most of us, as we hear the story of Zacchaeus, think, great story, I don't really identify. Not a whole lot about Zacchaeus resonates with the typical American person. Zacchaeus was a tax collector. He worked for a different government. He was very wealthy. Um, he was obviously diminutive. He was very small in stature. And so most of us look at Zacchaeus and go, good story, but I don't see myself in this one very much. But I think as we unpack this story of Zacchaeus and we look at it a little more deeply than we did when we were in Sunday school, that we might find ourselves in this character after all. We might find that there are more things in common with Zacchaeus than we originally thought. So let's look at God's word here in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Luke chapter 19, 1 through 10. And let's look at this story of Zacchaeus and his encounter with Jesus. Starting with verse 1. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. 
And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was short of stature. So he ran ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all complained, saying, he has gone to be a guest with the man who is a sinner. Then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he also is a son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to notice in this story, the first thing I want you to notice, and we'll come back to this toward the end of the story, but the first thing I want you to notice is that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And the Bible says here in the beginning of the story that he was simply passing through Jericho. He wasn't planning on staying. It wasn't a place that he was going to stop. And the reason that Jesus was in such a hurry and the reason that he was only passing through is because if you pay attention to the chronology of this story, you'll find that Jesus was on his way for the last time to Jerusalem. If you continue to read in the book of Luke, you're going to find that the Passion Week follows this story pretty closely. This is Jesus making his way. Scripture says that at this point in his life, he had <clears throat> turned his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. He had his game face on because he was getting ready to approach Passion Week. He was getting ready to suffer and die and to fulfill the mission for which he had been sent by his father. And so he's passing through Jericho. He's not planning on stopping. But on his way, the crowds have heard that he's coming through their town. And Jesus, at this point in his ministry, is probably one of the most famous figures in all of the known world at the time. Everyone knew who Jesus was. They had heard about the way that he taught with this authority that other rabbis did not have. They had seen that Jesus was capable of reaching down and touching lifeless people and giving life back to them. They're noticing that Jesus is someone that seems to pass the most desperate people and then leave them healed, restored, and new and whole. And people are excited about the opportunity to be in the audience of such an incredible guest who had come to visit and pass through their city. So great throngs of people are coming to see this Jesus that they had all heard so much about. And in this story, we focus our attention on this one little guy named Zacchaeus. We see this guy who is determined that he's going to have his moment with Jesus. Nothing is going to stop him. He will not be deterred. Now, I want us to think a little bit about Zacchaeus, who he is, and how he got to the point where he's at in our story. So the Bible tells us that Zacchaeus, there's several things that it tells us about Zacchaeus. First of all, we see that he is a chief tax collector. I was looking at that because I thought, I, I've never seen that statement before in Scripture. And I, I went back to research this week and I found that there's never been anyone else in Scripture described as a chief tax collector. There's other tax collectors described. As a matter of fact, Jesus actually chose a tax collector to be one of the 12 that followed him, Matthew. But no one else is described as a chief tax collector. And then I found that in early Greek writings, this is the only mention of a chief tax collector. This tells us that Zacchaeus has really kind of cornered the market on collecting taxes in his entire region. You see, the way Roman government, the Roman Empire, uh, collected taxes on those that they lorded over after they would take over a region for the Roman Empire, the precept would set a certain amount for each community that they would owe the Roman government for, tax, for taxes. And so they would say, hey, you know, this area of Jericho, they should be given the Roman government, and I'll just I'll just pull out a number, $100,000. And so what they'll do is they would put that amount out there for bid. And if you were the highest bidder, you could, you could get that $100,000 account. So here's what you would do. You would pay the $100,000 personally to Rome yourself up front. You would pay that up front. 
And then you would have the authority of the Roman government to go collect the taxes from the people in that area. And whatever you collected over the 100,000 was what you got to keep for being the tax collector for the Roman Empire. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of corruption going on amongst tax collectors, right? A lot of these people were overcharging. The more they could get from their people, the more wealthy they would become. And so there was a lot of corrupt tax collectors. Zacchaeus was the chief of tax collectors. He was the most corrupt of all tax collectors. He had done it so well and had become so wealthy that he not only had the franchise for Rome of Jericho, but he probably also had the entire region that he was in control of. And he had become quite wealthy by collecting taxes from his fellow citizens to give to another empire and for him to take his cut off of it. And as a result, no one liked Zacchaeus. He was the guy that everyone spoke harshly about. He was the one that everyone called a thief and a liar and a traitor. No one liked Zacchaeus. But if you think about this, and I'm speculating here, but I'm just putting all the elements of the story together and wondering how Zacchaeus got to the point where he was. Zacchaeus, the Bible says, was small of stature. He wasn't very well liked, especially after he became a tax collector. But I just wonder if Zacchaeus wasn't that guy that had been bullied his whole life. He was shorter than all the other people. I I, I did some research this week, and I found that um, Zacchaeus probably would have been well under five feet tall. From archaeological digs, they found that the common man during this era in this region was about five foot five. That was typical, five foot five. So for him to be known for his short stature, he probably would have been well under five feet tall. And as a result of that, he was probably someone that had become the butt of a lot of jokes. He was probably someone that others had picked on. He was probably one that got an attitude toward the people around him that, you know what, they don't like me anyway. I'm going to focus my attention on my studies. I'm going to become... I'm going to become wise. I'm going to figure out how to make money. And he did that, and he did it well. He made enough money to buy the franchise to collect taxes for the Roman government for the city of Jericho and made a lot of money. And then becoming the chief tax collector, he probably parlayed that money into more money as he took over other areas around him. And he became very wealthy. And as a result of that, he kind of got the last laugh. This is the way I see Zacchaeus. You know what? I don't care to be a tax collector. These people never liked me anyway. Who cares if they like me? At least I'll get rich. At least I'll have wealth. At least I'll live in a better house than all of them, and I'll have the last laugh. They can make fun of me all they want, but I'm going to get the last laugh. And so he went about his business of doing good business. In a corrupt way, he became very wealthy. He got everything he ever dreamed of. He probably lived in the nicest house in all of Jericho. He probably had the best camel to ride. He probably wore the nicest clothes. He was someone that everyone envied all that he had. And he got everything he had ever wanted. But what he found out was that he became what he had previously despised. The bullied had become the bully. And guess what happens when we become what we despise? We hate our own lives. Zacchaeus hated his life. He had a void in his life. He had gotten everything he ever wanted, but he realized it still wasn't enough. Are you starting to see how we might resonate a little more with Zacchaeus than we thought originally? Have you ever gotten that thing that you worked so hard to get, that you thought would bring you happiness and fill in all the gaps in your life, only to realize that it wasn't enough and the void was still there? You ever gotten to that point 
where you thought, if I can just get this, if I can get to this place, if I can make this amount of money, if I can have this property, if I can live in this neighborhood, if I can get to the place where I drive this vehicle, I'll have everything I want, and finally I'll have happiness and satisfaction in my life. But you get there and you realize that it didn't give you the satisfaction you were looking for and it didn't fill the void in your life. And Zacchaeus is in that exact place. And here's my question for you this morning. Do you wrestle with a void in your life? Do you ever feel like it's just not fully complete? Like there's just something missing. See, Jesus understood that as a result of the fact that our sin has separated us from God, that most of us walk around dissatisfied with our lives. Most of us walk around feeling like something is absolutely missing. And Jesus said, pay attention, people. I want to let you know something very important. I've not only come to give you life, not just breath in your lungs, not just the ability to make decisions and to have free will. I came to give you life to, here's how he cloaks it, the full. When you have life to the full, there's no void. When you have life to the full, you don't walk around feeling empty or dissatisfied. Jesus said, I offer you a life that is to the full. I offer you a life that is completely satisfied if you choose to live it. But it it comes from a different mindset. It comes from a different economy. What happens here on planet Earth is we think we got to look out for number one. And as long as I'm looking out for myself, no one else is going to do it, so I better look out for myself. If I'm looking out for myself the way I'm supposed to, I'll eventually get where I want to get, and I'll have what I want to have, and I'll have satisfaction in my life. And Jesus says that is completely upside down from the economy of the kingdom of God. The way to have real joy is to give your life away. The way to have real joy is not to live the life that you want to live, but to die to the life that you want to live and allow the life of Jesus Christ to live in you. So there is a way to live to the full, but it's all about an encounter with Jesus. And that's what Zacchaeus knew. Zacchaeus realized that Jesus could bring change to his life. You see, the Bible says here that Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming. Zacchaeus heard that Jesus was coming to Jericho, and it sparked an interest in him. It caused him to think to himself, I wonder if this guy who's brought so much good change to so many people, this guy who's who's capable of performing miracles, this guy who is teaching with such authority that he's changing the way people think about life, I wonder if he can bring this miracle of satisfaction and fullness to my life. And so he's going to do whatever it takes to get to Jesus because Zacchaeus was desperate for change. You want to know how desperate he was? Zacchaeus is the wealthiest man in his community. He is someone that people don't like, but he's also that guy that has it all. You ever been around the people that maybe you didn't like them at all, but they seem to have everything you want? That was Zacchaeus. No one liked him, but he had it all. He was a man that had prestige. He was a man that had authority. He was a man that had lots of money, but yet he was the man that humbled himself and acted like a child to get to Jesus. See, there's two points in Zacchaeus' journey to Jesus that sometimes we overlook that would have been completely ridiculous for a man of his stature, not stature, but you know, of his position, let's say it that way, for a man of his position to do. The Bible says that he ran in this culture, in this time. Men did not run. They did not run. It was considered ridiculous for a man to run. You know, if you think about it, even in our own culture, it looks a little weird to see a grown man like on a dead sprint, doesn't it? Like, when you see a grown man running, you start to go, who's chasing him? Or, you know, where's the fire? Or whatever. It's, it's, 
It's uncommon. It was really uncommon in the Middle East. Very uncommon for this man to run and to, to be so undignified in the way he presented himself. It was also completely childish and out of the question for a grown man to, cr- to climb a tree. Something that no one would do. But Zacchaeus, realizing that all he's doing is giving all of his enemies more fodder. He's just giving them more to talk about, more to make fun of him about by running and by climbing a tree. But he's so desperate for change that he's willing to humble himself like a child and do whatever he had to do to get to Jesus. It reminded me when I read this story of what Jesus said over in Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 4 says, At that time the disciples came... One more. There we go. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse four. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, in order to really come to Jesus, you have to humble yourself as a child. What does that mean? Well, children are very dependent upon others. Children know that they can't make it on their own. Children are aware that they need to be in the presence of an adult or someone that can help them to make wise decisions or to be able to have food on the table or shelter over their head. They recognize that they can't do it on their own. You ever been around a child that got separated from their mom at a department store? Have you ever heard that blood-curdling scream? Why? They know they need mom. See, this is exactly what Jesus says it takes to come to him and understand that you can't make it on your own and understanding that there's no way you can be reconciled to the Father except through the Son, Jesus. And when you come and humble yourself as a child, Jesus says, I, when, you, when you come this way, I will in no wise cast you out. Here's this man, Zacchaeus, that everybody can't believe that Jesus is accepting, that Jesus is spending time with. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, he has humbled himself like a child. I will in no way cast him out. So here's my second question for you. How desperate are you for change? You see, we might might be more like Zacchaeus than we think. Zacchaeus needed a change in his life, and he needed it now. And he was willing to do whatever it took for that change to happen. And he knew that Jesus was his only hope. And so he did whatever he had to do. He ran, he climbed trees, he made himself look like a child. Why? He was desperate for change. And then the Bible says that Jesus sees Zacchaeus in the tree. It's interesting that the Bible tells us that he calls him by name. I don't think Zacchaeus and Jesus had ever met before. And I know that Jesus is capable because he's God of knowing the name of the person that he's confronting without ever having been introduced to him because Jesus was 100% God and he was 100% man. He had the ability to know who Zacchaeus was. And maybe that's why he was able to call him by name. Maybe. Or maybe Jesus was able to call him by name because he heard all the sneers and all the jokes that the other people were saying when they approached this little man who had climbed up in a tree. Oh, look at Zacchaeus. What an idiot. Look at Zacchaeus. What a fool. Look at Zacchaeus. He thinks he's so big and bad. He's running like a child and climbing up into trees. Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus. And Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm sure in this moment that all of the people in the city that could not stand him we're super excited about all the things that Jesus was about to say to Zacchaeus. 
they were probably like, Jesus is righteous and he's good. And Zacchaeus is as crooked as they come. I can't wait to see Jesus give Zacchaeus a piece of his mind. They were shocked when Jesus said, come down. Hurry up, get down from that tree, Zacchaeus. I'm going to your house. I'm staying at your place. Now, you might think that's kind of weird. First of all, Jesus invited himself to someone else's house. It is weird. It's the only time it ever happens in all of Scripture where Jesus invites himself to stay at someone's house. It is countercultural. It's not something that was normal in the day. But let me tell you why it was okay for Jesus to do it. You see, for a rabbi of Jesus' fame, if he passes through a town, especially in this culture of hospitality where everyone is open to guests, that's the way their culture was. If you were a guest, you were always welcome. You always had a place to stay. It's the culture of hospitality that was prevalent in the Middle East in this time and still to this day is very prevalent in the Middle East. And, but when a rabbi of, of Jesus' caliber would come through, the person who got to host him, it would be a great honor to have this rabbi in your home. You would almost be, it would, it would be almost like you were validated as someone of great importance, uh, of, of, of being considered someone that was incredibly special, that you were able to host this famous rabbi in your home. So when Jesus says, I'm staying at your house, we see the response, right? The Bible says they started to murmur among themselves. Why does he want to spend time with a sinner? Why does Jesus want to, why does Jesus want to go to his house? He could go to anyone's house. There's so many good people in this community. Why does he want to spend time with that guy? And Jesus said, Zacchaeus, I'm going to your house. It's a great reminder that it's not by works of righteousness that we have done, but by his spirit we are saved. It's awesome to be reminded that Jesus has always been the Lord of the desperate you say, Pastor Frank, you don't know what I've walked in here with this morning. You have no idea how desperate I am for changing my life. I want you to know something. Jesus will never turn his back on someone who is desperate and seeking his help in their life. No matter what you've done, no matter what everybody else thinks about you, Jesus says, I welcome you. I'll come to your house if you'll invite me. I'll come to your house if you'll allow me to. When I read this story, I'm reminded of that verse in Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. You know, the pivotal word in that verse is if anyone hears my voice. Anyone. Not Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus is a crook. Zacchaeus is a known sinner. Zacchaeus is a messed up human being. Yeah, how'd he get that way? Was it not your sin that caused him to have sin? You know, come to think of it, you folks who are grumbling and murmuring about Zacchaeus, your sin is just as ugly as Zacchaeus's. Here's the truth. We're all sinners and fall desperately short of the glory of God. So I will choose to bestow mercy on whom I will choose to bestow mercy upon. And today, it's Zacchaeus. No one else has humbled themselves like Zacchaeus. No one else has been more desperate than Zacchaeus. And I will give my attention and my presence to Zacchaeus. And what does the Bible say that Zacchaeus did? It says that Zacchaeus made haste and received him joyfully. Jesus invited Zacchaeus into his presence and Zacchaeus joyfully received Jesus. And here's my question to you, question number three. Will you receive Jesus' invitation this morning? Say, Pastor Frank, I'm glad you're talking to lost people right now, man. They need to come and receive Jesus. They really need to be saved. Yeah, I, I hope that if there is lost people today, 
that they will understand that Jesus wants to receive them just as they are, right where they are. They don't have to turn over a new leaf. They don't have to become good to receive the help that Jesus offers. As a matter of fact, if you'll just give yourself to Jesus, cast down your sins, follow him, become a follower of Jesus today, if you'll just do that, he will help you get rid of all that junk in your life that you'd like to get rid of. He will help you change. He understands your desperation. He wants to be there for you. All you have to do is decide today to become a follower of his. That's all you got to do is receive that he died on the cross for you, that he paid for your sins, that he can give you access to the Father through the sacrifice that he made on Calvary. If you do that today and accept that invitation, your life will be changed forever. But Jesus has also given an invitation this morning to those of us who know him as Lord and Savior. You see, Revelation 3.20 wasn't written to the lost. It was written to the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. For the rest of us who already know Jesus, we have to ask ourselves the question, are we inviting him into our homes joyfully? the way Zacchaeus invited him into their home, into his home joyfully? Or is Jesus allowed into certain rooms in our home? Yeah, Jesus, you can be here, but don't go in there. Yeah, Jesus, you can have this part of my life, but don't touch that. Yeah, Jesus, I don't mind if you have some input on this scenario, but stay out of that one. And Jesus says, no, you don't understand. I, you got you to have me 100% or you don't have me. You got to be all in if you really want my presence. So will you receive Jesus' invitation? Here's what I love about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus' decision caused a visible change. <laughs> I mean a visible change. I wonder what it looked like, this change. Zacchaeus said, look, here's the deal. I am going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to make sure that I make good on every corrupt thing I've done. If I've defrauded anyone anything, I'm going to give them four times the amount that I took from them. Now, this is interesting because the law only demanded that he give them 20% more than he originally took from them. But yet he's saying, I'm going to give fourfold. I'm giving it back. If I took 100, I'm giving you 400 back. I, I'm, I'm going to give it back. Can you imagine what it must have been like in Jericho after Zacchaeus had this interaction with Jesus? Here comes the tax collector. He's knocking at the door. I don't know if you grew up in a home that, you know, when people came knocking on the door to collect your bills, your mom would go, shh, y'all get in the other room, be quiet. <laughs> Turn out the lights. Let's act like we're not home. Zacchaeus knocking on the door, shh, looking out the peephole, he's still there, be quiet. Don't say a word. I've already paid my taxes, he's not getting any more out of me. He's knocking, quiet. Finally, he gives up and he leaves, but they notice as he leaves, he drops something on the front porch. Mom finally says, he's gone, he's gone. Let's go see what's going on. They walk out to the front porch and they open the door. There's a bag of coins. And Zacchaeus said, this is four times what I took from you. I'm sorry for who I used to be. I'm trying to be different. I met Jesus and he changed everything. See, there's a visible change when we come in contact with Jesus. A lot changes. I shared with the football team last night the testimony of my dad. The verse that always resonates in my mind when I think about my life before my dad's salvation, my life after it was 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things are become new. See, Zacchaeus became brand new. He's a brand new guy. He's completely different. I, I like to think about the rest of the story. What did it look like in Jericho after this incredible life change for Zacchaeus? Here's this incredibly wealthy man who now is for the community instead of against it. Here's this incredibly wealthy person who now wants to do good things instead of live a crooked life. 
what kind of impact did this man have on his community as a result of the change that Jesus brought to his life? He became brand new. Here's my last question. Would you like to be new? Would you like to become brand new? Jesus said, I make all things new. That's what he does. I watched that happen in my home. I watched a man who was an awful father, terrible husband, become someone who led our family to know Jesus and to follow Jesus and to be there for us. I watched it happen. I watched someone become in Christ and old, all things passed away. Old things passed away and all things became new. I, I experienced that. I lived it. My question to you this morning is, do you want to be new? Because only Jesus can make that happen. Zacchaeus understood that. He was willing to humble himself. You know, I love the way Luke ends this little part of his book. He says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In all the Gospels, we don't see this statement, except from Luke. I got to thinking about how much Luke was interested in lost things. Luke chapter 15, we see the lost and found portion of the Bible. The lost son, the lost coin, the lost sheep, right? Right? You go all the way to the beginning of Luke and you see a story that's not in any other of the, the Gospels when you see Jesus being lost from his parents. Or in, in essence, what we find out later is the parents are kind of lost from Jesus. <laughs> Luke has this incredible sense of interest in things that are lost. And then it dawned on me, Luke's the only Gentile writer in all of the Bible. He's kind of an outcast. You see, the way Jews thought about Gentiles in this time was they were just, they were second-class citizens. They weren't to be respected. They weren't. And Luke was that one from the outside. He's a Gentile. He knows what it feels like to be lost in the midst of a crowd, but yet Jesus chose him. Yet Jesus used him. So Luke talks about what it looks like to be lost and to be found. And I love what Luke says in chapter 4 and verse 18 of his gospel. He gives Jesus' mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus says this in the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown. He says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Luke said, I want to make sure you understand that Jesus, his whole purpose is to find things that are broken and lost and to redeem them. But if you read this verse, you think, well, this doesn't really fit Zacchaeus. He's not poor. He's the oppressor, not the oppressed. Here's the beauty of it. Luke realizes that Jesus not only wants to redeem the poor and the oppressed, but he also wants to redeem the wealthy and the oppressors. Anyone who is lost is someone that Jesus wants to bring in and give a new life to. Jesus says, look at, look at Matthew 21 Verses 31 and 32. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, by what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? I'm sorry, that's the wrong verse. I need 31 and 21, 31 and 32. 21, 31 and 32. I'll read it to you. says, which of the two did the will of his father? They said to him, the first, Jesus said, assuredly, I say to you, tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. 
For John came to you in the way of righteousness and you did not believe him, but tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Here's Jesus talking to the religious, self-righteous people of the day. And he's saying, you're at a disadvantage because you're so filled up with your own self-righteousness that you can't accept the goodness of God because you think you've got everything you need. But it's the tax collectors and the harlots that are willing to accept that they are void, that they are empty. And because of their willingness to understand their lostness, I will find them and I will bring them home to have a relationship with my father. Jesus said, this is, this is who I choose, those who are desperate enough. Here's the last thing I want you to see about Jesus and Zacchaeus. I want you to see the difference between what the crowd says about Zacchaeus and what Jesus says about him. Jesus listens to the crowd berate him, criticize him. Jesus says, you're a son of Abraham. You're accepted. Jesus says, you're, you're good. I love what Romans 2, 4 says. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearing and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads to repentance? The goodness of God is what leads people to repentance. And that's what I want to appeal to you to consider this morning as you consider this story. I want you to consider the goodness of God. No one else wanted to offer Zacchaeus a chance. But God in his great goodness said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to honor you with my presence at your home today. No one else wanted Zacchaeus to, to be a part of the family of God. But Jesus said, you're prime. You're desperate. You've humbled yourself. You need change in your life. You're exactly who I'm looking to seek and save. See, maybe you're in that situation this morning where you know you're desperate and you need change and there's a void in your life and you want something new and you'd like nothing more than to be new. You just need to take the same path that Zacchaeus did. Now, I don't have a sycamore tree out there that you can climb up in. But the good news is you don't have to climb a tree to come to Jesus this morning. You don't have to run anywhere. You simply have to humble yourself and say, I am nothing without Jesus. There is a void in my life. And if I need anything, I need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I need to make sure that I'm a follower of Jesus and I want to give my life to him. Maybe for the first time or maybe again. Lord Jesus, I am yours. I'm your follower. I'm desperate. Would you stand with me? Let's consider the word of God this morning. Father, we ask you in this moment to help us to honestly answer the questions we've asked this morning to answer the questions about the void that we feel in our life, to answer the question about our need for change, to answer the question about the invitation that you've offered us and what we do with that invitation, to answer the question of would we really like to be new? So God, I pray that this morning we'll answer those questions honestly. And Lord, I pray that if there be someone here this morning who does not know you as their Lord and Savior, that today they might make that decision to lay down their sins at the foot of the cross and take up the righteousness of your son and our savior, Jesus. So Father, I pray you'll have your way. For those of us who know Jesus well, who have followed Jesus, but find ourselves in the same spot as the church of Laodicea that was re-invited to sup with Jesus. May we today recognize the fact that we have an open invitation to have personal fellowship with the God of the universe. And Lord, may we be reminded how much we need that relationship, how important it is in our lives, and how that we can be renewed in our mind and our heart every day if we are building that relationship. So God, have your way in this time of commitment. May your people respond. 
And Lord, most of all, if there's someone here that doesn't know you, may they be desperate enough to step out from where they are and accept your son Jesus as their Lord and Savior today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.